You, yes, you, listener. Did you know that everybody at History Hack works for free? And as much fun as that is, it would be great if we could garner just a little bit of support for all of the time and effort that goes in to producing the show. Uh, I have a cat that needs food. Zach has Airfix models to buy. And Boney, well, Boney likes books. So if you can chuck us a couple of quid as a one-off by Kofi or subscribe to Patreon, we would much appreciate it. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's instalment of History Hack. I'm really excited today. So we had a little bit of a gloss over of 13th century influential women uh, a while back and got very excited about some of them in particular. We also got very excited about trashing King John because he's just a dick of epic proportions. Uh, So Matt, who have we got today to help us take a deeper dive into two of these women that we got excited about? We've got a guest all the way from Arizona today. And she joins us, wonderful Kristen McQuinn, who is a medievalist um, at Arizona State, which is fantastic. And we are very excited to have you here with us, Kristen, because we're going to be talking about Isabella's and then slagging off King John. So you are most welcome. How are you doing? How is Arizona? <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, Arizona is in its one of its two months that has really nice weather. So <laughs> <laughs> you mean it really, dips really below hot. 100, right? <laughs> yeah, I think right now it's going to be 70 something today in the high 60s, low 70s. So for us, that's really nice. So I have friends in Arizona and they, uh, what is it? Is it the Arizona tumble dry where you just go and put all your wet clothes outside and five minutes later they're dry? You is that, could. That's, yeah, <laughs> you absolutely <laughs> could. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Brilliant. So this is going to be based on your book, which is The Two Isabellas of King John. Uh, yep. So we're going to talk about both of them, um, who both had the misfortune of to end up married to him. Uh, yep. Should we just quickly tell our listeners and recap to them why? So why is King John not the ideal husband? I mean, he I, I'm assuming you're asking me, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, well, he, if I ask Matt, his answer would be based on the Disney one with the lion and the snake. So it oh, should definitely be you. Maybe a little and, bit different. And, and yeah. ironclad. I do have a soft spot for ironclad. <laughs> <laughs> no, although the, the one with the snake and the lion is maybe okay too. Um, no, John, John was definitely not a um, faithful person, which in the Middle Ages wasn't necessary for men to be faithful to their wives, but he didn't really have a very good example of a, of a uh, peaceful marriage. I don't think his own parents had a very fiery marriage from all, uh, all accounts. And, um, he didn't really seem to like his first wife at all. And he might have been somewhat obsessed with his second wife, although that's open to debate. So I don't think either one was really the uh, foundation of a healthy, healthy or happy marriage. So let's kick this one off then. Let's talk about our first Isabella, Isabella of Gloucester. What do we know about her early life in the happy days before John? In the happy days before John, we know literally nothing about her, nothing. There's no existing document that tells about her birth or her upbringing. Um, There are actually really few mentions of her even as an adult after she was married to John. Um, We don't even know for sure what year she was born in. There's a lot of a a lot of debate about that. Um, Some people even argue about whether her name was Isabel or Isabella, but she there was one record that referred to her as such. So we just kind of went with that. Um, So I had to do like a lot of circuitous research to find out anything about what her life even might have been like when she was younger. So when does she come into the record then? Is, is it going to be when she marries John? And how does she get picked? Um, more or less, yeah. Um, she was one of two, or excuse me, one of three daughters of the second Earl of Gloucester. Um, she had two probably older sisters. Um, basically what happened was that John's dad, Henry II, made a deal with Isabella's father um, to get, basically to get... Um, John some land. Um, the, the Earl of Gloucester's only son had died. Um, and so that would have normally put the inheritance on Isabella and her two sisters in pretty much equal portions. But Henry made this deal with him um, so that John would be the, the Earl's only heir and he would be married to Isabella. 
Um, and then that also made Isabella the Countess of Gloucester in her own right. And so basically disinherited her sisters from, from the Gloucester title or estate after that. So was she the young the younger of the sisters? Sorry, did I did I miss that? But so so she sort of jumped jumped the queue a bit. <laughs> she did jump the queue a little bit. Um, we think that she was the the youngest. Um, I think that that's the most compelling argument, um, just because her other two sisters uh, were already married, which is partly why the Earl had agreed to that kind of agreement with um, King Henry the Second. So after she gets married, what do we know about her then? Because you would think being Queen of England, there'd be lots about her. You would think, um, but no, there's still actually not much about her even when she was married to John. And this is before he came to the throne. She was never the queen. Um, so I don't know if that factors into it, but you would, you know, you would still think that being married to somebody who became the king would have some kind of documentation. Um, but no, there's still not a whole lot. There's, um, there's evidence that she traveled with him a little tiny bit in the beginning of their marriage. They had signed a charter um, together sometime around 1190 or so um, when they went to Normandy. But then after that, there's really not a whole lot listed until um, later after he marries his second wife, Isabel of Angoulême. Um, it indicates, the records indicate that um, John had helped maintain Isabella's household. Um, but that's, there's really almost nothing left about her that we know of that has existed down to us. But we know that the marriage sucked, right? I think the marriage sucked. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine that it would be a, a pleasure. Um, they don't really seem to have liked each other. Uh, they never, they didn't really spend very much time in each other's company that we know of. Mm. Um, Almost all of, or all of John's illegitimate children that we know about were born during his marriage to his first Isabella. Um, right away, almost, as soon as he married Isabella, he was trying to get a new wife, actually. He wanted to marry Alice, who was the um, sister of the French king, Philip Augustus. Um, and he was actually in talks with the French king to have that happen. So like right from the start, he was trying to, to dump Isabella. <laughs> um, the thing with Alice went nowhere, especially once John's own mother found out about it and had a fit. Um, but yeah, so right away, it seems to have gotten off on the wrong foot and that's that's not good for her, I don't think. So how how does the switch happen? The switch happened to her. It's a ter terrible thing. How did <laughs> oh my God, you're going to get called out now by all the wokes for being a massively chauvinist like pig, aren't you? <laughs> Well, I've, 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 I've hid it on this podcast for 18 months now, so it's, yeah. it's about time to appear out. Um, <laughs> so, so how does um, Isabella II come into the picture here? And what do we know about her before her misfortunate marriage with John? <laughs> um, kind of the same. We don't really know a ton about her childhood. Um, there's a little bit more than there is with Isabella of Gloucester. Uh, we know that she was the only child, or at least the only surviving child, of Aymer, who was the Count of Angoulême, and her mother was Alice of Courtenay, so through her mother she was related to the French royalty. Um, we know that she was raised for a little while at the court of Hugh the Ninth, who was uh, Hugh Le, 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 excuse me, Hugh de Lucinan. I don't um, know if I'm saying that right, but um, she was engaged to him and it was pretty common, I guess, um, back in the day to be uh, raised in the court of your future husband. Um, so she was living with him for a little while and she seems to have met John around late 1199 or early 1200. And we don't know for sure when they actually married, but it was uh, probably around uh, February or so of 1200. I'm really interested in her because she um, she's not popular, is she? No. Um, I, th I referred to her the last time as the Katie Hopkins of the 13th century. Who's <laughs> hideous right wing person who is just like a hate figure for everybody. Um, every okay. time she opens her mouth, she gets it in the neck. OK, <laughs> yeah, she was definitely not popular, but I think that that isn't necessarily an accurate 
um, mm. portrayal of her because you know you have to think that the the con the documents that we have and the chronicles have all written have all been written by men. Yeah, um, they were all clergy, so they were you know by uh, their job description they were kind of isolated from women. Um, they didn't like it when women had opinions of their own in general, um, and they really didn't like Isabel of Angoulême. Um, yeah especially Matthew Paris, he really seemed to have it in for her, but it was, it was kind of weird too, because he was writing a good 50 years or so after the reign of King John. So he didn't even know her personally. But did she as well? I thought with her that it sounded like she'd been dealt with quite brutally herself. And that's just how she in turn deals with other people. I, that's a absolutely valid perspective. I think that that's not necessarily wrong. I don't think that we'll know for sure, of course, unless some magic, you know, private hidden diary shows up, which would be awesome. I would oh, yeah, that. it's just in um, a chimney somewhere. <laughs> okay, it could happen. All of, that kind of stuff seems to happen in Britain, doesn't it, sometimes? Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that um, without that kind of personal re record of their lives, we won't ever really know for sure. But um I just think that she has kind of gotten the short end of the stick throughout history. Um, I, some of the things that she did were certainly not the greatest, but I think that maybe she was demonized a little bit more than she maybe should have been. I, I'm, 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 I'm intrigued really here because this, this is, one would say the more successful of the two marriages. So what, what, was, what was their relationship like? I'm, this is my prejudices coming in. I, I, you know, okay, he's yeah, it's good to be the king. Thank you, Mel Brooks. But yeah, you know, how 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 does how does this work? Because it's not go, it's not really going well for him. And here she is coming across the channel to, or ish to um to marry into, and a supposedly up and coming nation. Um, well, if you're asking me if they had a happy marriage, I don't think so. I think that that would depend entirely on a lot of things that you looked at. Um, yeah, but honestly, again, there's no, there's no personal journal or anything from either of her or John or of Isabella of Gloucester. So we don't really know. We just kind of have to um, take what we do have. And, you know, she was really young when she married John. She was maybe about 12 or so um, is the average age that that we seem to agree on. I hope that she found some happiness in her marriage, but given who she was married to, I don't really think that's very likely. There's so evidence that he did like leave her alone until she was older though, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I mean, she if she was married when she was 12 or possibly even younger, which there's some debate on that, which is kind of gross. Um, there, there's evidence that, you know, they didn't even have a child until they had been married for almost seven years. So, um, it's unlikely that he would have probably, you know, bothered her very much yeah. until she was a little bit older, partly because she may not have even been fertile yet. Um, and if, if, even if she was, she was so young that that would have been extremely dangerous uh, for her to have a child at that age, uh, especially when, you know, childbirth was already a dangerous thing for women. So, um, so yes, there is evidence that he left her alone for a while, which is good. And then they yeah. proceeded to have five children. <laughs> She ends up remarrying. So and how old is she? You, so she mentioned she comes in, but she's she's very young. But then obviously he dies um, and she remarries again. But how old is she when she's sort of freed up from this very early marriage? Well, if she if she really was 12, when mm. they got married and there's there's some debate. There's, you know, some people think she was as young as, you know, 10 or so, which I don't really agree with. But and then other people think that she was older, closer to 16 or so, but let's just say she was 12. She was married to John for about 10 years. Um, so she would have been in her early twenties. And then, um, she, she, um, didn't have the greatest life after he died because she was completely shut out of having any say in her son's upbringing who became Henry the third when, when John died. Um, he, she wasn't allowed to be his regent. Uh, his guardian was William Marshall, the, the knight. Uh, so they completely shut her out of having any say in her in her son's upbringing. Uh, she eventually left England, and she also left four of her five children with John behind. 
Um, and I don't know that she ever really saw them much again. She did see Henry the uh, excuse me Henry the Third a couple times after she left England. Um, but after she leaves England for the last time, after John's death, she's actually taking her daughter Joan to be married to the son of her own former fiance, Hugh the, Hugh de Lucinen. And uh, instead of letting her daughter Joan marry him, she decides to marry him herself. So that's kind of, she snaked her, <laughs> yeah. her, her daughter's fiance, which is maybe not the nicest thing to do. And this is what I was uh, referencing when I said, like, I think like her, it had been so brutally done with her and she'd been dealt with so sort of like, um, I want to say like prof professionally, like there's no sort of room for feelings or anything that I do. You, I don't even think like it would have been a big deal to her to do that, but she does come in and nick her daughter's husband. <laughs> she does. Husband. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I mean, that kind of thing is, I can understand where she gets her bad reputation from because that yeah. is just not something that we should be doing. But then she, you know, she tells her son, she explains it to her son, Henry. Well, I did it more for your benefit than for mine. And I mean, it, it sounds like an excuse and it sounds like a really um, kind of sketchy thing to do. But from a political standpoint, it maybe was actually a decent thing to do. Hugh um, was still older than Isabel. He was certainly a whole lot older than Joan. Um, he would have had to wait years to have a baby with Joan, who was still, I don't know, seven or eight when she was engaged to him. He, she was a little girl. Um, and so to, to be married to him and to have somebody who that she could immediately give children to, um, you know, from a political perspective, it, it might have made some sense. But her kids do quite well for themselves, don't they? Because Joan misses, misses out on the Frenchman, but nags a Scotsman. Yeah, they all had high high ranking marriages. I don't I didn't focus on her children very much, so I don't know all of the details, but um but yeah, they all married kings or princesses and dukes and earls and everything. So, yeah, they did they did great. <laughs> they did all right for themselves. It it's interesting that her her two marriages though tend to feature the rebellion seems to happen quite quite heavily in it. So, so what sort of happens with her marriage to Hugh? Because that's a bit of a rocky road, much like the, the final days of John. Yeah, well, and it's funny too, because actually Isabella of Gloucester also, her second marriage was um, pretty rebellious as well. But um, going back to Isabella of Angoulême, uh, her, her second husband, um, they had wanted to rebel against the king because they, against the French king, because that's what they did. I mean, it was just like a habit, I think at that point for them. And so she had talked her son, Henry into giving them some military support and he sends his, you know, support the way he promised his mother and they reneged on it. So, um, the, on, on the help that they were going to give to Henry. So he sends troops over and nothing is set up the way that he was told it would be. And it was just a huge flop. Um, so they backed off of their rebellion and it just kind of went nowhere. And then uh, in later years, she uh, was accused of poison, trying to poison the French king uh, when she was older. <laughs> and I'm not entirely sure that was a meritless accusation. And then she fled to sanctuary at um, Fontevraud Abbey, and she stayed there until she died. I'd I've like been her. there. It's epic. Is I've, it? I've, I've never been. I would love to go. <laughs> I, it's funny. I was just looking at the pictures we took when we were there just the year before. I mean, it's a beautiful place. It's I've got that weird there. turret on it, hasn't it? Mm. Part of it? Yeah. I think I went because I was on like a mission to find, I want to go to where they have all the bits of Richard the Lionheart because he's like scattered all over the place, isn't he? So I've done <laughs> ruin where his heart is. And I think there's just, I think I've just got an arm left to track down now. Uh, but he's mostly there as well. So you've mentioned difficulty with sources. Um, how do you, how do we, or can we even sort of piece together their personalities? Has that been possible at all? Uh -huh. I actually, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't think that there's really any way to, to figure out what kind of a person Isabella of Gloucester was like. There's just nothing mm -hmm. written about her at all. Um, we, we simply don't know. And then again, the, the stuff that we do have about Isabel of Angoulême is not very favorable. 
So it's easy to see her as some kind of a shrew or, you know, harpy kind of person, um, mm. just a shrill bitch. Maybe if I can, I don't know if I'm allowed to say yeah. that on your podcast. But <laughs> We've said much worse on this podcast, don't worry. Yay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I can see where that perspective comes in again, because she's done some things that are pretty not nice. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I think that she was very young and she had bad examples of um, you know, John wasn't a good leader and that was her husband. And she, you know, didn't have tons of contact with her family after she married him. Um, so after she was married, that was her sole example of how one acts. And as we all know, John wasn't maybe the best <laughs> example of anything. So, um, you mentioned that we have like uh, chronicles and that they're all, I mean, it would be great, wouldn't it, to find a chronicle by a woman who just went, I really hate that these things are always about men. I'm giving the world this. Uh, something <laughs> like, who's that um, Constantinople person that Kit's obsessed with, uh, that princess that happened to just write everything down in the ninth oh, century? Um, and, and we just talked about her, Anna. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, uh, we don't have that. Do we have anything that would help us like to redress the balance or do we have to look like official documents? I don't know, like, do we go through, do we go through wardrobe finances to sort of find out if she was living on a pittance and stuff like that? Is it that niche trying to find out about these women? Yeah, it, it is. And actually the, that's kind of interesting because there are some of King John's um the roles that they had with his budget basically. Yeah. And we can see that he did support Isabella of Gloucester for a long time. Um, and he wasn't totally stingy. I mean, for the time he, he was pretty generous. He gave her, um, you know, nice fancy cloth for dresses and things. And he, you know, gave X number of barrels of wine or, you know, all of these different things. So they didn't seem to have a completely, anim uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of animosity, it seems, between them after they divorced, but um, it would have been really uh, bad of him, I guess, to take all of her lands because he held her in wardship for 10 years before he let her remarry. Um, but he did seem to, you know, keep her up okay. Um, and weirdly, he had her uh, take care of his second wife for at least a year after they got married. So, uh, he gave them more uh, of an allowance as well when they were all living together. Yeah, that's not weird. No, yeah, maybe not like it would be more charming <laughs> if he wasn't also holding like two Scottish princesses hostage at the same time and like yeah, refusing to let them live their lives and stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and he he basically sold Isabel Isabella's hand to uh, her second husband for an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, and that was after he'd had her as a ward for 10 years after he'd been married to her for 10 years prior to that. So there were some really weird dynamics going on here. I just don't... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ugh, he's just, uh, he's grim. He's I don't... Like, so yeah. you mentioned um, that her life wasn't great after he died, but do, what do we know about what happened to her? Which one, the first or the second? The second, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting um, our Isabella's crossed, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, there's too many people with the same name. Um, you know, she, like I said, she had a pretty dramatic, there was just so much drama for her after, um, well, through her whole life, but after John died too, again, I mean, she wasn't allowed to, to take care of her son or to be his regent. Um, like I mentioned, she stole her, her own daughter's fiance. She tried to have, um, uh, a rebellion against the French king. So, I mean, there was just, she seems maybe if I were to say that her personality was just very dramatic, she's just one of those people that um, is constantly maybe seeking attention in some way, whether they mean to or not. And this is just me speculating. I absolutely don't know for sure, but yeah. it seems like just from what we do know about her, she was uh, maybe a drama queen and prone to um, doing some crazy things that were not in her own best interest, but she couldn't seem to help herself. They, they, these are fascinating women. Do we, can we tell through the histories about what sort of influence they actually had on John, if anyone could influence him at all? But, you know, they, um, they seem to have had some influence, but can we actually pinpoint that other than being, you know, locked up for 10 years as a ward? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I think that probably, to be honest, we there they didn't have as much influence over him as we might have hoped um, for for somebody who was married to him for ten years um, and who was married to him as a as a queen uh, during his reign. Um, I think the events of their lives certainly influenced him and probably in ways that we may never fully understand. So, you know, the birth of a child, for example, is always going to affect a parent, especially the birth of an heir, which John wanted, um, as any king would have wanted. Um, so that's to be expected, you know, that there is that kind of influence when people's lives are so entwined like that. But they also lived in what we would consider a really patriarchal and even misogynistic society. So it's also not super likely that they're going to be listening to their wife. Um, obviously, there's there's some um, uh, ex uh, exceptions. Excuse me, uh, exceptions to that. Um, but John doesn't seem to have been one of them. He just doesn't seem like he was going to listen to any woman except for his mother and. To be fair, Eleanor of Aquitaine would scare anybody, I think. So. I mean, that's true, but uh, Matt's face is just like, which makes him even more creepy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it is kind of creepy when you think about it, because um, there's a, um, a role that the, most of the queens had for a while still in, into um, John's reign. And they were, um, they had the queen's gold and it was for, for the queen performing her job as a queen, basically, and interceding on behalf of people and, and doing all those things. And Isabel of Angoulême didn't get that for five years or so, four or five years into her uh, reign as queen because it went to his mama. Um, <laughs> Eleanor of Aquitaine was still doing a lot of the queen's functions. Um, I mean, she is a his. monumental figure, isn't she? Like, she is. I mean, talk about somebody that you'd like to have at a dinner party you know yeah. living or dead i would love to see what she would what she was really like definitely Terrifying. i Terrifying. think she said <laughs> like we we ran uh, didn't we the greatest britain in history and actually she she stoked really high um on votes she she got into i think she was top 20 wasn't she matt yeah i think so yeah i can see it i mean that would be talk about the mother-in-law from hell i mean i can't yeah. even imagine <laughs> I mean, I I, this is about, we're segueing now, but we're talking about influential women in this period. I mean, Eleanor of Aquitaine, has she got something to answer for with her son's personality, really? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, John was, <laughs> John was her youngest, her last child. She, she was, I think, 45 when he was born. By all accounts, it was not an easy pregnancy. She and Henry were having a lot of marital problems right then. She... Um, was just about to, I think that was right when she was starting to uh, maybe get her older sons in on a rebellion against Henry. I mean, it, that, that happened a little later, but, you know, so they were having some, some major marital problems. So it, it's entirely possible that Eleanor resented John a little bit. I mean, I'd, I'd be pretty unhappy if I'd had 10 kids, I think. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> like you, I thought I was done and then you came along. I know you came along. God dang it. So um, either I, that I or I guess it's the coddling the youngest. I mean, like, that you'll never have another one. And so this one just becomes a monster. Yeah, maybe. I think that he was actually Henry's favorite child by mm. all accounts that I've read. Um, maybe not so much with Eleanor, but he was probably coddled with Henry. <laughs> so I, I remember we went to the Abbey because just going back to Isabel, too, because I'm I'm. I'm just in in my head now i'm in the abbey because you've got sort of henry there's four and, of them in there isn't there yeah and i uh, see you've got sort of you've got henry henry the second um eleanor at the sort of top bit and then you've got you know some of richard the lionheart yeah <laughs> it's most of him to be fair it's only an arm and a heart that's missing oh yeah <laughs> oh, only yeah, yeah. You, you you get by with that and I don't arm know why they person. felt apparently I think it's the the arm sword arm or whatever had to be somewhere else but yeah it, it's all very strange but Isabel II's next to Richard the Lionheart which when my daughter went oh is is, is that his queen I'm like no that's his brother's queen and she's mm -hmm. so <laughs> after telling telling the stories because that's that's all very strange in in and of itself because they don't they don't bury her with, well, I say family. They don't bury her with the in-laws initially, do they? She's 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 outside. Yeah, she actually was originally buried still at the Abbey, but 
elsewhere. And then I think that um, Henry III, when he came to visit her grave after she died, was kind of horrified that she wasn't buried inside. So he had her moved. Mm. And um, if you can get there, do, because where they've been protected and Henry VIII couldn't get near all of the the sort of uh, trappings of religion as far as those burials are concerned, they're beautifully yeah. painted like wooden um, effigies, aren't they? Uh, mm. That have done really well over time because they've yeah. been like basically protected from our own despot of a monarch trying to obliterate the <laughs> religion. Um, where's John? Because he's not there. He's at uh, Worcester Cathedral, I think. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Worcester Cathedral, yes, yes. I think, I think it'd have to, <laughs> now, now that I'm kind of saying that, I'm second guessing myself, but I think that's correct. Um, yeah, because he, he died uh, of dysentery, I think, when he was running uh, after he said yeah, he was <laughs> running away. I'm just laughing at Matt's facial expression, because he's <laughs> basically saying with his face, if ever a guy deserved to shit himself to death, <laughs> it's King John. <laughs> Is that what's going through your head, Matt? I, I, I was trying to conceal it, but apparently not, not so much. So you have no poker face whatsoever. <laughs> oh, what made you want to try and write a book on these two women? Because like you say, it's not like, so Matt and I are sport rotten with our 20th century history. We've got sources coming out of our ears. I mean, this is a <laughs> challenge. Yeah, you know, it's actually, it's really weird. I have a, a blog that I mostly use for book reviews, but every once in a while I'll throw up a um, an actual article of some kind onto it. And apparently one of the editors at Pen and Sword, Dana Messer, um, had seen something I uh, wrote on my blog and um, had sent me a request on LinkedIn. Um, hey, do you want to, you know, write a book about these two women? I'm doing a, a series of books on medieval women. I didn't see that message for like eight months <laughs> because I don't know how to use <laughs> Who LinkedIn. Who checks their LinkedIn messages really? Well, no, I honestly don't. And I have no idea how to use LinkedIn. And I told her that when I finally saw it and was horrified and contacted her. And I, I said, this is probably way too late. The answer is probably no, but I just wanted to let you know, I just now saw your message. And if you're still wanting somebody, I'm still interested. So um and she was very gracious and was like, yep, it's totally still open. So, um, and the more I thought about the, the content, actually, the more interested I um, became in trying to tell their story, just because there's not that much known mm -hmm. about it. Um, I realized that all I knew about Isabel of Angoulême was the generally unpopular um, version of her. And I only knew that Isabella of Gloucester existed, <laughs> but nothing more than that. So um, I guess I kind of just wanted to see if I could learn about them for my own sake and maybe change my mind about how I viewed the second Isabel. This is a classic history thing, isn't it? A classic history yeah. thing where you're like, nobody's done this book and it sucks. Well, I'm just going to write it myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of, it did kind of happen like that. And I'm really grateful that it did. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have written it. Um, I learned a whole lot about not just the women, um, but the time period and John and I learned that I still just do not like John and <laughs> uh, he seems like a real peach um, he yeah he's like oh, I, I think my favorite I will never move away from that image of him sucking his thumb and calling for his mom because um, if ever if ever that was accurate in a Disney cartoon I just think like I could see him being like that especially yeah. with Eleanor as a mother yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been so much better though if Eleanor and Aquitaine had shown up as like a lion or something like that? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Who's being mean to my son? Because then every that movie would have had a very different ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is true. I think well, one was, of my like, favorite like... characters are the vultures and um the chicken. The chicken the... is great. She's great. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> Well, it's funny that's, that's an interesting can... segue isn't it now we're now talking about disney disney adaptations of king john's story and, and yes and, for those and, of, how, how for those of you that aren't it. following what the hell we're going on about is disney's robin hood where they're all animals and king john <laughs> is an idiot lion who cries and sobs for his mom but he has this idiot snake which is is uh, who's the snake leslie is it leslie Oof. i can't remember there yeah no, I can't, because I always think in my head... No, it's Terry Thomas. I always think in my head that it's Kenneth Williams, but it's not. Um, it's Terry Thomas doing the voice of the snake, which is quite epic. 
And then you've got another chicken who plays the guitar as well. If you haven't seen this, it is a 1960s Disney classic. Uh, and I don't I probably I like to think that it's not that far removed from the real King John. Also, as well, um, that portrayal of King John in that stupid Russell Crowe film, Robin Hood was quite epic <laughs> because he was just whiny and annoying and I just thought it was probably bang on. I mean it could have been like the the um lion sucking his thumb I don't know I, I do think that John was kind of a whiny little get sometimes but um there was a scene like when he not a scene not in a, in a movie or anything but when uh he had tried to rebel against Richard when he was off on the crusades and Richard came back and forgave him but he was like it's okay John you're just a child and you were led astray and here come and have some supper with me well he, John was 27 years old at the time and had children of his own so that was like an <laughs> epic burn <laughs> for Richard to have said that yeah um, I literally you are 27 and a fully grown ass man and I still see you as no threat because you're that pathetic yeah yeah <laughs> So he could have been just the whiny little jerk that <laughs> he's been portrayed as in so many movies. But so, so interesting to try and find out about the women that had to live with him. Yeah, I don't, I don't um, envy any of them. <laughs> I just <laughs> feel so bad for them. Yeah, I, I'm, I've, I've, I've gone down a rabbit hole now. I'm looking at who's played King John in... <laughs> in <the movie. laughs> And I forgot the voice of it. Peter Eustonar in the Disney one. It is, yeah. Yes. That was like his heyday. Was that not round about the time they made one of our dinosaurs is missing as well? And he pretended to be Chinese, which you would just never get away with now. I, I, yeah, I, I love Peter Eustonar, but uh, you think, well, you, he, there are two, I'm going to say this and I'm going to throw it out there and you can all shoot me down. Actors of too high a quality have played this man. <laughs> you know, Oscar Isaac, Paul Giamatti, you know, he should be getting like, you know, walk-ins off the street to play him because that's probably, you know, don't try to give him gravitas or see emotional depth in the man because he didn't have any. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I just, I just, re I just really don't like it. But I, I will give a shout out to Ironclad because I know it's a, most people hate that movie, but I like it. It's got friend of the show, James Purefoy in it as well, which is always worth watching. So I don't it's think I've fun. seen that one. I'm going to have to look it up now. Yeah. yeah. Guy gets catapulted against the building and he goes splinch and it's all very good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Even unless you need to suspend your belief though, otherwise you oh, might yeah. end up throwing things at the screen. It'll be like oh, Matt yeah, it, trying it, to watch it, Pearl Harbor. It's, 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 <laughs> it's not... It's not the most historically rounded of films, but it looks good. And there's lots of people going splidge. So yeah. technical term that, splidge. Yeah. <laughs> a good term. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because I don't even mind it so much. I mean, it, it does make me crazy, but on one hand, but on the other hand, I don't mind it if there's not a ton of historical accuracy in movies or books, because I hope that it makes people curious enough to go out and look stuff up for themselves. I don't know how often that actually happens, but... I maintain optimism, I guess, in that one. <laughs> it definitely well, yeah. happened with Titanic because we had film people hanging around for about a decade after that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Kristen, for coming on to talk to us about the two Isabellas of King John and your new book. Uh, Matt will, of course, make it available in the History Hack bookshop. And do go and buy it from there because this is Zach's latest spiel. Don't give your money to Jeff Bezos, who will just go and spend it on rocket fuel. Give it to bookshop.org because that supports local books, independent bookshops. It supports the author and it actually supports History Hack as well. So go and buy it from there. Otherwise, you'll make Zach very angry and you don't want to see Zach when he's angry. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about these two uh, really interesting women. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 